or somewhat handsome gentleman, depending <laughs> on your taste on your screen right now, all in varying degrees of thought, very deep thought, as we let everybody infiltrate into our digital domain, we will soon have Jared, we will have Alex, we will have Ben and we will have Skin talking about the single malt program, the, the, the lineage, the one and the Mirador, fine single malt beverages from your good friends at Balcones Distilling. So settle into your pews, get your wallets ready for the congregation plate, and let's imbibe and enjoy a fine conversation. Are they in yet, Ben? We good? Are we still kind of rambling? Or really, uh, yeah, we're up. We're up. We're partying. Would we like to officially begin or do we still uh, meander? I mean, we can just begin with the whole time. Yeah, I was that, gonna say, is how is it is the whole thing not meandering? Is it that's uh, actually what? a good point? <laughs> start the program. Does the is our program? And this with that, we'll start the program. Hello and welcome to Whiskey Talk, brought to you by your friends at Balcona is distilling. Yeah, still to appreciate. We are uh the two guys that look like they're not whiskey connoisseurs, would be me and Ben. We're your hosts, we're the radio monkeys. I'm Jeff Skinway to the Ben and Skin Show. He's Ben Rogers. Oh, and he just put on a Ben and Skin hat. Look at what a baller move that was. We don't have those. I don't have one of a kind. I can't begin to tell you how frustrating it is for my brother to see this bill unbent. Yeah. Which brother? All all my brothers. Nice. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Hi, Ben. Guys, hi. I will be showcasing... A few different hats for your enjoyment during this whiskey presentation. That's very I had, exciting. I had a hat I was gonna wear. Well, two things. I'm. I just realized every once in a while when you're about to open a bottle, you can tell that the noise is gonna be the sound is gonna be good. Oh, because it's just kind of jammed in there. Oh, so I was getting. I was getting my. I was getting my pores lined up. Well, now that I talked about it, it's probably gonna be lame. But <laughs> hey, oh, that was all right. yeah. that's okay. good. That was um, actually great. very exciting. Yeah. As, uh, yeah. I, I primed you for it. I am curious about that. As we get this party started for people following along at home, like I have some fresh bottles I'm going to be cracking and I'm very excited about that. I'm going to release the Kraken Unleash and it. yeah, I'm just going to be unleashed. And um, so I want those bottles to breathe a little bit before I pour the samples. No, or does it not matter? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not like wine necessarily. I like the pour to breathe. So I wouldn't necessarily say open the bottle and leave the bottle open. Um, I would, I like to pour all my stuff up and let it sit for a little bit. Cause I do change over time. Um, but yeah, fresh crack. That's a, there's a hashtag for fresh crack. Okay. So on fresh crack, if we are going to crack it with some tap water, would you do that right before you sample it or right when you pour it? Both. Why not? All right. You know? um, uh, by the way, that is Jared that is talking. He is the distilling badass at Balcones. That's what my business cards say anyway. And the man in the fancy hat is Mr. Alex. In, oh, what's up, homie? I thought it was. I thought it was bit. I just. I thought we were just going to talk about JJ Reddick the whole time. But I mean, we can talk whiskey too. It doesn't. Yeah. You know. Oh. oh, I feel like so. I feel like uh, Jared had a comment he wanted to make there. Well, <laughs> no, not about Reddick. I was just going to say, yeah. Before I made my cork pop, oh, sound. Sure. I, w- I was going to say I my my day ended up being weird, but I had a hat I was going to wear, and I've worn Spurs hats before somewhat intentionally to mess with you guys. Although I feel like Texas does a better job for, for, for a state that's got three professional basketball teams. I think we do a pretty decent job. The, the, the internal rivalry is a little bit like in good fun. It's still family. Yeah. You know, obviously the Spurs currently are not the Spurs of, of old, but I still get happy when I see the Mavs and Houston doing their thing. So um, if I got a pick, you know, a, two, a Houston team or a Dallas team over, you know, an LA team or New York, New York team always. Right. Um, 
but no, I have this hat I was going to wear, but I didn't end up making it back home before we did this to get it. But you guys know 47 and Carhartt have those collaborations. I don't know oh, if you've seen those. Yeah, but yeah they, they've done NHL and NFL. And then this year they, they dropped all the NBA ones. So they have flat bill and curved regular snapback. I, they're not even snapback. I think it's like a leather like slide, but yeah. it's a Carhartt collaboration. So they're all like the camel, the Carhartt yellow. Duck that, canvas. That like, okay. Yeah, duck canvas yeah. with all your NBA teams. So I, I've got my Spurs one that showed up. I haven't done the wax, the oil cloth uh, waxing on it yet to make it waterproof, but I was going to wear it tonight and I didn't make it home. So I don't have it. Dang. So it's an empty threat. I mean, I just, I just feel like we have a preview for the next whiskey talk. I know that yeah. that just happened. And go get yeah. your Mavericks ones. And by hey. the way, speak it while we're, while the sports is coming up. Um, I, I don't know how you guys square with this. I would love to hear you guys let me know your take on the fact that my Spurs that have kind of nobody right now are a couple games ahead of the Mavericks with all of y'all's badassery. Uh-huh. They, were in, they were until last night, Jared. You okay. should get us up with that three days ago. Okay. Fair but enough. Um, no, I think it's a testament to how awesome they are. And a really weird thing almost happened today that hardly ever happens. The Spurs almost traded to the Mavericks midseason as Trey Lyles was almost a part of that J.J. Redick deal. And as we were on the air hearing about that, I was like, the Spurs never do that. And then 30 minutes later, it was known that the Spurs actually did not do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they, they very send, much stayed true to form in that they, regard. They send out of state. Old Pop sends people out of state for sure. Yeah. But it was so, weird. I haven't really even been keeping up with the Spurs record because honestly – a year like this, it's kind of like, why? Right. And then um, I listened to a lot of NBA radio in the car, I'm serious. Um, and I can't remember if it was Termini and Johnson. I can't remember who it was that was talking, but they were kind of running down West standings. And the fact that the Spurs were up on the Mavs, I was like, what? It yeah. doesn't make any sense. No, like, they're uh, that is a crazy the Spurs. That's why they don't ever give up, man. They're sitting there clinging on to a playoff spot with not much future hope because they are. They're, I mean, they don't lose. It's not what it's they crazy. do. It's crazy. It's crazy what Pop pulls off with almost nothing. Agreed. It's bonkers. And he's got, I don't know if you've seen him recently, but he's got my hair. It's just completely white. <laughs> he has a mullet now, which is great. COVID, COVID Pop. COVID yeah. Pop. Uh, well, boys, do y'all want to jump in with some Mirador and talk about this bad boy? Mirador. Brand, brand new Mirador. So, yeah, Mirador just shipped. Um I've got a soft spot. Anybody familiar with our portfolio? Maybe it's, maybe it's hard to remember because we've been doing this for a few years now. But before Mirador existed, um, you know, we're kind of known for pretty big, bold, pretty intense flavors, really dense, kind of compacted. We try to put as much flavor as we can into a small package. Um, but, um, you know, we, we started the distillery. We, we're guys that are absolutely at our core inspired by what single malt traditionally has been um, largely coming out of Scotland, of course. Um, And from the beginning, we were like, Oh, we're going to kind of bob and weave a little bit and go a different direction. And so there was never any need to kind of replicate or attempt to replicate that tradition, even though that's kind of where our our roots are. Um, But we always had refill barrels. Most of our single malt goes into virgin Oak, which is a very American, way to treat whiskey. Um, but we always had these lying around and we would use them a little bit in our one single malt, but not much. And at some point we just decided, man, some of these barrels are so good. We've got to release these on their own. Um, and there's, I've gone into this before a couple of times when I'm, when I'm talking to, to folks about kind of the overlap with my backgrounds, but my, you know, my, my training was actually in fine arts. I was going to, I thought I was going to be a ceramics teacher. I thought I was going to go and teach at a college, but the the Eastern and the Western traditions have very different aesthetics. You know, the West is all about novelty, newness, put your, put your fingerprint on something. Whereas the East, if you, the idea of the masterpiece is when the, the journeyman, the apprentice has gotten so skilled that he can put his work in a lineup with the master's work, snatch the pebble. And it, you can't tell the difference. Like it's absolutely about learning the craft and the trade well enough 
to pass for your master's work. Um, so in a way to finally come full circle mm. to some of the things that inspire us, a largely space side single malts and release one in that vein and in that kind of profile, we hesitated for a long time. We started talking about it in like 2014 and we didn't release something till 2018. Um, now we're on our third batch and space sides, of course, they're oily, they've got a great texture, but they're, they're, they're subtle compared to our normal lineup. They're, they're, the wood is really understated, a lot of fruit, you get grass and hay, some subtle, subtle spices. Um, so it's probably a little bit of um, a deviation for people that are super familiar with most of our whiskeys. When they try this, it seems like it's a, it's a pretty far offshoot, but this is in some ways our nod, our nod to our heroes and kind of our nod to where, we, where our inspiration comes from. My first thought is I see the bottle uh, compared to Lineage and the flagship one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, Mirador is significantly lighter. Yeah. The coloring is significantly lighter. And then I look on the back. I'm always intrigued by the back of the bottles. Like whenever I have a bottle of Balcones, I feel like it's, uh, it's, it's so crafted and, and so magical and so special. And there's all these hidden Easter eggs all over it. And some things I don't know. And I've always been curious about the batch. Now it says, Batch M I R twenty one dash one date one thirteen twenty one. So what does that mean? So yeah, we've got little two or three letter codes that go with each product. So it's Mirador. So that's where the M I R comes from, and then it is really just sequential. So the first two digits there are going to be the year. So this is 21, 2021, and this is the first bottling of Mirador in twenty twenty one. Of course for some of our regular, more regular release products and some of our less special releases, there can be a bunch of batches in a year. Mirador happens once a year. So every year it's gonna be 21-1, 20-1, 22-1, whatever. Um, when we get into lineage or the one single malt, those might have uh, three, four, six, depends on the year, depends on kind of the volumes we're looking at. Um, and these are the kind of the nerdy details behind the scenes, but really our, our tanks, our bottling tanks are a big factor that goes into how big batches can or can't be. Um, so we can only fit so many barrels in a tank and we usually try to kind of max that out because you spend a lot of time blending, sometimes two to three weeks getting a product blended. Um, obviously, if you can do that and not have to do it for four months, that's a, that's a more efficient way to use your time. Um, so yeah, Mirador happens once a year. And, how, many, uh, how many bottles will this produce approximately? Ooh, Alex, do you know? I don't know. Um, um, seven. Well, this is seven bottles. We, seven, yeah. the four of us, have them all. We have the four <laughs> bottles. Um, so, good luck, everybody out there. Um, I think. I mean, that, that's kind of a, a good uh, look at uh, kind of a, a piece that's not the exact bottle count, but looking at maybe kind of the distribution map. Because, like Jared said, this is the third year, the third release. Um, I think internally and actually externally. It's one of our most popular whiskeys that we we release every year, um, and this year it's going out to distribution to the largest range of states, and uh, it's going to 16 different states, and that that does include Texas, of of course. We're not going to skip over the home state, um, but we're we're opening it up to a lot more markets uh, than than we ever had before. You know, as far away as New York, Massachusetts, Georgia, um, so. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. I'll look it up uh, in just a second. But um, it's still, because we have strategically designed it to spread a little bit more to treat some of these outer markets that have grown for us over the last year or so, um, it, it means that we do have a lot more, but it's still very much a special release. And it's not, there aren't, you know, 20 case displays at every single you know, independent or specs or right. you know, whatever, to total wine, it's still probably going to be a one case here, one case there kind of thing, because we, yeah, we don't, we don't make very much of it. And to Jared's point, at least right now, it's once a year. So yeah. It's and it's funny, release. it's funny, like, um, you know, you lay the whiskey down in the barrel and of course the barrel, not only is the whiskey kind of an agriculturally based product, but so are the barrels. These are, these are trees that are harvested. They have their own unique, rainfall, soil conditions, all that stuff. Um, so every barrel is different. Um, grain batches are different. But this, specifically the kind of barrels we look for for Mirador just don't happen that often. Uh, we have, I think, 
we looked at something like 375 barrels or so. And I, I can't remember the exact size, but we picked, I picked uh, like less than 30 out of that number that were what I was looking for to go into this blend. So um, yeah, it doesn't always, it's a hard, this, this specific profile is a really hard thing for us to just manufacture at a large volume because they're kind of the cream of the crop. They're kind of the unicorn barrels, even in our refill program, they're the barrels that just really make us, uh, you know, we get excited when we smell them and they go together into this. My, my quick yeah, math, I think is, it might've been a 15 barrel blend. 15 this time. Okay. Yeah. 15 or 16. Which would produce roughly how many bottles? Uh, like it, it sounds a lot when you say it this way, but it's really, it's really not that many, but I think it's, it's like a little over 5,000 bottles. Mm -hmm. Um, that sounds like a lot because if usually 5,000 of anything um, is a lot, but in the grand scheme of trying to then considering we're in 46 States now, <laughs> yeah, plus yeah. the UK, EU and Australia, and they're, everybody is begging. There's nobody that's like, stop making whiskey. People are still begging for more volumes. That's not very much whiskey when Jared and team just completed a, a you know, a single malt blend that was close to 200 barrels. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the one of the things about you guys is we've gotten to know Balcones better over the years is, uh, you know, we first started out as just being fanboys of your whiskey. Uh, and then we got to know you guys personally and know what great guys you are. And we were also told that, you know, and we've seen this, you guys are one big family and you have a soft spot for Mirador because it ties back to somebody you care about a great deal. So explain uh, that connection and why you have such an important soft spot for Mirador. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's crazy. We're actually right at the uh, two year anniversary of, um, the passing of my previous kind of main blending partner, Zach Pilgrim. Uh, he's been with Balconies from the early days. Um, true blue cask and, uh, rumble cask reserve two products that are pretty well loved by a lot of folks. Those were his brain children. Wow. Um, he started out as an unpaid intern, literally like driving up from Austin and sleeping on my couch during the week and going back home on the weekends to his wife. Um, but yeah, it's actually right about the two year anniversary of his passing. Um, he left the company for a while and came back in 2014. And in our, in our few years apart, um, we had both kind of gone the same direction with our scotch preferences. And I was like, man, I am just drinking like these floral, delicate, it's kind of like, we've talked about this before, but even with beer guys, you kind of go crazy with a 14% barrel age stout with nibs and vanilla bean and, you know, wasp stingers from Zimbabwe or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then if you're, if you, if you're in the beer scene long enough, you may still like that stuff, but there's a soft spot in your heart for just a really well done Pilsner. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, space Side is kind of that. If you need to be punched in the face, you might overlook these kind of softer, they're, they're grainy, they're, they're fruity, they're delicate, they're understated, which, which is one of the things that's really nice about a whiskey like this is that it can kind of be, it can be present at a moment without having to be, um, you know, on center stage, but there's also plenty for someone who's more experienced and you want to, you want to pick it apart. You can absolutely do that, but at the same time, it doesn't, it's not demanding attention. Um, but we started talking about that in 2014, and it was just a really nice synergy of, man, you know what I've been drinking a lot of, you know what I've, and then it was like the same idea. So we started working on batches and we just kept not bottling it because it wasn't quite right. And um, one of the last um, significant blends that we worked on together before he passed was the first bottling of Mirador that we uh, did in 2018. Um, so yeah, this is always going to have a soft spot, both for just aesthetic reasons space sides were really a big part of my journey into getting excited about whiskey and falling in love with single malts um and then also you know my right hand guy for for many 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 years a big a big part of the development of uh what balcony's whiskey is and was and has become um and he's not with us anymore so yeah doing these blends feels like uh there's a there's a there's a responsibility there we have kind of something we have to um, live up to and honor because um, the first batch really like we, we 
we really did knock it out of the park and he was a big part of, of getting that done. So yeah, when we sit down with those barrels, it's a little emotional for some of the other guys on the blending team. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, we can't help but have it, have it kind of harken back to who he was and uh, thoughts and reminisces. And usually somebody in the blending room brings up, remember that time, you know, that kind of stuff. So. That, you um, know what that kind of reminds me of, it reminds, it makes me think about a lot of different things, but uh, you know, you lose someone and obviously there's a personal connection, but I would imagine for what you guys do with building Balcones, that's kind of like a double whammy. Cause I would imagine he's very, has a very astute palate and he knows how to do something that is very difficult to do. And then I would imagine that puts additional pressure on the other blenders when, a guy who's right there with you is no longer there. And I'm sitting here, how many blenders are there? And what, it, what is that, what is that whole blending process like? Me and Ben have never seen anything like that. Yeah, we should get you guys up here sometime um, now that everybody's getting their vaccines and whatnot. Um, the blending room is right ad adjacent to my office, right through that door. Uh, I don't know the square footage. We've got two probably like 18 by 18 rooms that are connected. Um, at any given point, there's probably six or 800 jars little vials out on the table that are all samples from different barrels um there's multiple projects going on we've kind of got it set up so we can work on different things at the same time um so originally there was just two people in blending back from the early days of balconies and then um, when zach came on we kind of had two and a half uh, with our our unpaid in intern that we had in zach and then uh yeah he was kind of my right hand guy and gabe who's now taken an, uh, a seat as one of the one of the senior blenders on the team um, he was kind of learning the ropes um, before Zach passed. We had him in there for, with us for a good six to eight months, and he was kind of getting a feel for how we do things. But um, right now, there's currently me and then Gabe. We got to get him. We got to get Gabe on here sometime. He would have a blast. Yeah. Um, and he's he's so important to to facilitating all the all the high end stuff that I need to do. Um, and and he works with Alex a lot on the single barrel program. His, we just changed his title to spirits manager, but his, he just kind of has to like corral and shepherd the barrels and also the production schedule and um, to, to kind of think into the future and forecast for the things we need and make sure we're doing today what we need to be doing. But so we currently have me and Gabe full-time in there. Of course, full-time doesn't really mean 40 hours of doing smelling and tasting, but, and then um, Johnson is also a full-time blender uh, just recently, but we also have some new hires on the stills. So he's mostly, he's spending a good chunk of his time training people and checking their work. Um, Alex is up with us uh, a couple days a week now, driving down from Dallas, helping us with some single barrel picks and some other stuff for his uh, single barrel program. And, um, and then we've also got a guy named Daniel, who's uh, a part-time blender as well. who has got really promising either. He writes really fun, fun notes. We, 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 uh, there was, there was a note, the other day, he puts a little post-it note in front of a sample, and it was something about shooting a squirrel from the front porch or something was the tasting note for that one, um, yeah. which I, I'm not really sure <laughs> if that's helpful for me to come behind someone who left a note like that. That doesn't really tell me that much, but I appreciate the um, creative writing. Right. The creativity of it. Interdisciplinary is... approach. It was right. actually because Alex has, for the single barrel stuff, you know, he was trying to give Alex some ammo some like really fun kind of fleshed out narrative stuff that he can, as he goes out trying to sell people with single barrels that he can have some fun stuff to work with. But I've never shot a squirrel from the front porch. So I don't really know exactly what that moment smells and tastes like. You know, the, uh, the internship discussion is an interesting discussion because like in our business in radio, uh, like we work at radio stations where so many of the employees got their foot in the door. Good pop right there. Um, as being an intern. And that's how they got in. And apparently uh, in our business, um, one of Howard Stern's interns sued him for like, hey, dude, I'm doing all this work. I'm not getting paid. This is BS. And so in our business, they almost stopped doing internships altogether. They're incredibly rare, which yeah. is unfortunate. But I would tell you that I think the greatest moment and, and mention in pop culture history when it comes to internships is from The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. You guys ever see that movie? Yeah, where there's a bunch of people shooting at each other, and uh, Bill Murray tells these guys not to shoot. He goes, "Don't shoot at these guys; they're unpaid interns." <laughs> that 
that summarizes i can never even think of the word intern without thinking of that um well, well i'm going blank on his name right now and i feel really bad because this is this is the the, the this is the the perfect kind of trivia venn diagram overlap for the kind of conversations we have Ooh. um the producer from um the defiant ones what's I'm, I'm just blanking on his name right now oh uh, jimmy ivy yeah i mean yeah. his backstory too he's just like farting around he wants to hang around the production table and next thing you know he's working on what was the was it uh, i believe he went to Fleetwood. go record, was it john lennon on thanksgiving that wasn't his first oh. one he, he tells a story about getting kind of dumped like he had, really didn't have that much board experience and he gets dumped i can't remember if it was tom petty or springsteen maybe it, it, was Fleetwood. it, it may have been it fleetwood have been mac springsteen. yeah it was one of those though but the, basically he's just like hanging around trying to learn the ropes and someone just walks away and is like yeah you track it and it of course ends up being like a legendary like yeah know, hall of fame rock record but i can't remember from the documentary which one it was but it was one of those three it was either tom petty springsteen or, or fleetwood mac but I think it, it was th that's a that's another great like intern story <laughs> just like leave the intern with the controls and yeah. produce produce like a legendary album you know love it um, yeah well i think uh you know before we um move on to lineage uh in light of zach maybe we should all do uh one more last toast on mirador doesn't that seem like it'd yeah. be appropriate seems very Good appropriate Does is that this is a this is a good uh yeah just it's her, just started rolling around uh around texas uh this last week and this week so it's very fresh uh it's also fresh on the palate uh but it's very fresh to the market so if there are any folks looking for it um it's rolling out all across the state so uh, excited to see Mirador again out in the wild. Yeah, and let me say this too. Uh, you guys know I'm a big, I love single malts. And that's one of my favorite things about you guys is what you do with single malts. Um, and we're probably about to dabble in lineage here. And we talk about that being a good entry point. Man, Mirador is a pretty good entry point too. It, it's, a, it's a real easy drinker. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I love all different types of single malt. So I'm not, might not be the, best indication of this but one of the things is you know you mentioned floral it, it it's, a, it's a very light drinking single malt in my opinion that might be a good place for people to start with you guys as well i, I think that would make a lot of sense yeah we don't talk about it in terms of entry point partly because just how limited the volume is right. um it's not that easy to find um but yeah it's a that's it, it's such an approachable um yeah. easy easy Maybe not for a bourbon drinker because they're expecting more wood, which is we'll get into that when we talk about the one. One has kind of in some ways played that role for people that are like, yeah, I don't drink scotch. Like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this, I was actually thinking about your barrel uh, skin. Yeah. This is, this is kind of that without the smoke, you know, in some ways. This is, um, if you remove the smoke from the equation, this is kind of the backbone that we put the smoke on for, for your single barrel. Oh, wow. Really cool. Really cool. Um, yeah, I heard we might do some more of those. This year. Is that true? Oh, yeah. what? Let's go! Oh, that wasn't that wasn't on the agenda for the. Uh, hey, that's not that. I don't see that bullet point on the on the talking agenda. Right, well, I, as soon as you said that, I saw Alex just take a big giant swig. Yeah. So, hey, man, Alex just yeah dollar signs had the cash register. <laughs> 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 that yeah, uh, that uh, gets me excited, man. Yeah, Maybe I just got an email from app. Gavin, and uh, Gavin is going to call us into his office after this and he's gonna holler at us for talking about weird things what is that <laughs> oh man that's ridiculous you know is that like a uh, cartoon version of you let me just tell you something uh only a true narcissist would wear a hat with their own face on it and i just i'm here to drink whiskey with you guys and let's not worry about what hat or i'm wearing or not is my face on it or not on it we don't know all we know is great hats are in the house <laughs> i thought it was jonathan it's, it's not Jonathan. Yeah, it's like you can't wear your own. You can't. You can't wear your ba your own band shirt on stage. Yeah, right. Bad, bad yeah, form. Exactly. 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 <laughs> My, uh, we were we were at a place and um, there's this uh, this lady. Her name is uh, Uncle Becca, and she calls herself Uncle Becca, and she makes um, uh, inappropriate trucker hats, and she'll oh. put whatever you want on a hat right there while you wait. And so my sweet sweet daughter asked for one of these hats. And so she wanted to put my face on one. So I got one too. And we wear these together. So nice. that's awesome. <laughs> Uncle Becca. Yeah, Uncle Becca's. <laughs> I saw some of those hats. Those aren't hats you would wear 
a lot of places. Some of, some of them have cuss words in them, Alex. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Yeah. Wordy yes. dirts. Wordy yeah. dirts. Yeah. So lineage. Well, before we move on to lineage, oh. we should say for those of you that are watching, if you like a little bit of the sweetness, if you like a little bit of the floral, uh, Jared, you kind of mentioned the oily feel. Um, if that's right up your alley, I think beer door is the single malt for you. And as we mentioned, if you, if you didn't catch that earlier, you know, it's, it's one batch, baby, they bottle it one time a year. And so, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't think you can get it later in the year. It's probably going to go pretty quick. So if you're out and about spirit hunting, now is the time to jump on Mirador if you see it. Yeah. We may have talked about this past episodes, years past, but Mirador is like, um, so Balcones is, uh, the Spanish word for balcony and because of the fault line that runs through basically right under 35 Waco is a part of it anyone that's ever been down to the river um, the Brazos and the Bosque meet and there's a huge limestone kind of escarpment if you're on one side of the river you're like 80 or 100 feet over the other side where these these two plates connect um, and so it looks like a balcony on different sides of the the fault lines you you can kind of be on a balcony looking over to the other side. And Mirador is a synonym uh, for balcony. It's more like a parapet. Like, you know, you see the little, the little pods on the side of like a, a castle where like a look, a lookout would be or yeah. an arch archer. That's kind of what a Mirador is. It just, I mean, to Mirar, to look, it's a, it's a lookout. So it's kind of a, a spot, an architectural uh, component where you kind of look out and survey the landscape. And for us to harken back to some of our, our kind of heroes and inspirational distilleries that kind of started us on our, on our single malt journey, um, this idea of like a lookout where you, you kind of survey the landscape, you kind of see what's the deal. Um, and to use that, that, that word just felt really fitting at, to do this thing. It was kind of different from what we are known for. And at the same time, kind of like, you know, you're kind of kneeling down at your, at your heroes and saying, we, we tried to make a masterpiece. Does this stand up, you know, to the work of, of our heroes? So uh, really cool. Lots of special, lots of special things about this whiskey for us. Absolutely. You know, uh, as we move on to lineage, which has been very highly regarded last year was the first year of lineage, right? Yeah. Like August. It, yeah. Um, it, it hadn't even been out a year. Has it? Wow. No. Um, and I remember being very excited when I was told about it. Uh, and so that might be a good place to jump off. Alex, why is this called lineage as you show? Yes. Whiskey global advocate top 20. The, I believe it is the first American single malt to get that distinction to be in the global top 20 of whiskey advocate, which yeah. that yeah, should sure. put the picture in the frame right there. Look at that bad boy. Yeah. These, these are, I think these are, these are brand new. So this, the bottles that we actually happen to have. So, Speaking of looking at the, the batch codes and everything, um, so this is 21 1. This was just bottled two days ago. So this is at least what we're looking at. Yeah, mine um, says March 19th on the back of this bad boy. Yeah, oh, I March 19th. So, yeah, okay. So this has been part of this most recent. I picked it up two days ago, but it's, it's the most recent uh, bottling, I believe. Less yeah. than a week. Yeah. Well, and, and also it takes multiple days to bottle. So, the bottle I've got on my desk literally came off today. Line bottles were coming off and I grabbed one. So wow. it says March 19. It, it, it takes a while. The, the batches are big enough where it, it doesn't all get bottled in one day, but cool. Really cool. Yeah. But this is, this is, is yeah, it's funny. It's got the, the brand new whiskey advocate top 20 award uh, neck hanger on it, which is really pretty uh, highly reflective gold catch your eye. Um, and it's got this really neat quote. And I believe this is the quote from Whiskey Advocate about lineage. And it says, as American single malt ascends, Balcona shows its leadership with, the triumph with this triumphant offering. They're putting both American single malt and the state of Texas on the map, which is really, really humbling and, and amazing because this is kind of, when, when you think of single malt and everything we've, we've, we've made over the year, and again, I'm kind of speaking for Jared because he's the creator. I'm, Please do I'm, speak for me. I'm I'm just a little bit of a, a tiny voice, having always loved the distillery and been only working here for a little bit. But this this feels like a little bit of a 
a culmination of years of exploration and old world, new world ideas and kind of, uh, would you say progeny, you know, an, an idea of, of putting, putting something forward that's going to continue to build and pave the way for, um, for those to come, but then also just continuing to innovate by way of malt releases. But um, Jared should go into more specifics. Um, I love this whiskey. I mean, I love Mirador, but this is by far my favorite whiskey that we're making right now. Wow. Um, yeah. So this, I, I, I love this whiskey. I love hearing Jared talk about kind of the, the origins. I know this is, they're, they, I'm going to speak for them and say they get really excited with the idea of blending lineage. It's an arduous task to blend lineage because there's, there's just, there's so much philosophical and, and kind of esoteric conversation, but then also a lot of palate development conversation flavor profile development and because it has hit something like this where it's the first time a texas distillery or an american single malt um producer has ever landed on whiskey advocates top 20 it's now kind of like okay this is this is serious we've always taken it seriously but hey okay the, the, something's going on here and it's because of lineage yeah um if mirador is a pretty over the top explicit nod to space side single malts lineage is somewhere in between uh I, if i had to do the venn diagram i guess it's really like two or three different aspects of each tradition so most of our malt program historically has been with golden promise which is a scottish barley variety most people don't realize this but even most scotch is not made with scottish barley um, there's about three, I think 3% of scotch is made with Scottish barley. Most of it's made with you, uh, British barley, which is fine. That's great. Um, but we use Scottish barley for most of our single malts until about what now, six years ago or whatever, five years ago when Texas barley became viable and our work with uh, Blacklands malting and their work with Texas A&M to try and uh, develop varieties of barley that would, would thrive mostly out in West Texas panhandle area. Um, so now we find ourselves at this junction a couple years back where uh, we have viable barley that's uh, specifically been bred to grow well here and do well in Texas, which wasn't an option prior to like 2016. Um, and you combine that with the philosophical kind of you know, ancestry of how traditional Scottish and Irish single malts and even Japanese that are matured versus American whiskey, not American single malt, but American whiskey in general goes into new barrels. Um, bourbon and rye is a lot about the barrel. Um, and yeah, these wheels start turning of, of how, how can we morph all of that stuff together? So we currently lay down our golden promise uh, Scottish barley in both virgin oak and in refill, uh, X bourbon or our own uh, X rye, X corn whiskey, whatever. And we also lay down this Texas barley now in virgin oak and in refill barrels. So all of those components are kind of on the table, um, which does make it kind of messy. It's you've, there's a lot of flavor and a lot of aroma sitting out to to pick through, um, but. We talked about this, I think, when it launched. We really do believe that American single malt is is poised to really take off in the next few years. And we are by no means the first to, to, to dip our toes in it. Um, McCarthy's uh, Clear Creek Distillery, uh, the guys out in Nantucket, Triple Eight, are good friends of ours. You know, shit, they're releasing 15-year-old American single malts and have been for a while they've been wow. at it uh, st george's out in california there's there's some pre there's some predecessors that definitely were ahead of the curve um that paved the way for people like us and westland and westward and um anyway american single malt's having a moment for sure and we're just i i, I we've always tried to be diligent we try to do our job this this is the culmination of here's the old world tradition and approach, new world tradition and approach, and then also the raw ingredients being from both sides of the pond. Um, it just kind of a little bit felt like a no brainer. We had all these 
components out like we often do. We're just working on single malt. It's like, let's, we need to pull all these special projects. We've laid down all this Texas barley with no really idea of where it's going. Um, and we actually were working on developing a lower proof, slightly less, you know, bold and robust profile from our one, which is next, um, to intentionally create something that if we really want to welcome people into this conversation of, uh, of what's happening with American single malt, we need to have it be approachable and the proof needs to be approachable. The price needs to be approachable and the flavor profile needs to be easy. And uh, we were struggling with it and we weren't super happy about where it was going. And, and we just happened to have all the Texas malt out. Um, and it was kind of a after the afterthought to like, well, let's, let's, let's try and throw these two together. And yeah, then the, the, the result was uh, more complex than we, we could have achieved with either, either or. And um yeah, to end up on the on the whiskey advocate top twenty, the first American single malt to do so. I don't know. i You said the first Texas whiskey. Maybe that's true too. I think it's it's definitely the first time for us. Um, but yeah, now the pressure's on. We got to keep we got to keep it up. You know, we got to deliver. A lot of people uh, ask us about lineage and come up. You know, we talk about all the different uh, types of balconas, but this is one that is probably in the top three for people who come up to us and say, this is my favorite Balcones, which I know you got to love hearing that because you yeah. hear it about so many different bottles, like you know, Rumble's my favorite, Baby Blue's my favorite. You know, the people say all, all these, but we get so many people coming back to us on this. And I think the, the word is inclusive because the way it's priced, it's not uh, every, everyone can get this bottle. Everyone can afford this bottle and it's really high end, high quality stuff. But the, I think the number two question we, we get though, about any about is, is people always want to know what is this symbol? What is, what does this mean right here? Yeah, I get weird about symbol stuff. I, I really like abstraction and I like, um, yeah, it's a weird one. I, I rummage through and I play around with once again, having an art background, I, I, I do all of our label design and I, I'm constantly struggling with things that can kind of exemplify and stay really vague um, and kind of, kind of hopefully convey maybe even a feeling more than a thought. Um, but that is a really abstracted take on um, the horizon line and a sun. It's, it's used across um, I don't want to be accused of appropriation, but some of the inspirations, I, I, I look at a lot of uh, even um, Native American symbols and stuff a lot. And I have alchemical stuff and even some Nordic. I kind of have all these like images that I've saved over the years of just symbols. And then as, as an artist, you try to figure out next, like, how does that relate to something? Um, but uh, this is connected in multiple cultures to the idea of offspring and heritage. Um, and that's kind of why we landed on it. But I think even some of the other guys attached to the idea of um, this is this is meant to kind of look at as it's, it's a it's a vague take on a horizon line and the sun. And it's nice because it's bisected right through the middle. Is it is it setting or is it rising? But in the idea of lineage heritage, what's the next step? What's the next generation? Um, in my mind, I imagine it rising. Um, there's this thing obviously it comes up and it goes down every day and it's the cycle. Um, and it has some newness to it, but it also has some continuity to it. Does that make sense? I don't know. It's kind of, uh, yeah. it's a really nice way in my mind, abstractly to kind of connect honoring traditions and at the same time, jumping off of those and kind of moving forward into some new stuff. Um, sure. Yeah. I, don't know. I love it. I think like uh, to, I don't know what the technique would be called, but because it's not a perfect circle, like it almost looks like it's been charred, for example. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's a, I think that makes it really extra interesting too, especially if the idea of the sun is burning, right? That almost has like a charred kind of look to it. Yeah, if that's because that, something yeah. that you burnt to make the impression. I didn't draw it with a stick in the sand, but it was a Sharpie on the back of a napkin that I, that, that I scanned in and then zoomed into. So wow. I love the kind of irregularities of stuff. Yeah. I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. Symmetry and like that kind of stuff's not super interesting to me at all, but 
And, and if you hearken back if for you guys, I'm sure you guys saw them, but like our 10th anniversary in 2018, our 10th anniversary single malt releases were kind of the first time I dabbled in that kind of vaguely, uh, these, these vague, almost alchemical type symbols. Um, but yeah, these, I don't know, this is very primitive. These are like raw, they're instinctual. I think they're meant to be, they're meant to feel a little more emotional than, than, than heady um, and, and non-representational. It's, it's nice that it does kind of convey the idea of, of a sunset, sunrise, but um, I like that even that's ambiguous. Which one is it? It can't tell. Um, you, you can bring your own stuff to the table, you know. All right, let's talk about the, uh, first let's talk about the nose on this bad boy. What do you guys smell? All right, I gotta, I gotta pour more. I just- uh, I don't have a problem with that. You killed it? The whole bottle. He killed it. <laughs> Oh, there's the pop. Nope, there's yeah. a good one. That's a good pop. One of the things that's really cool, that the, the Golden Promise does, the Scottish barley that we use does give a lot of like honey and stone fruit stuff, which people like to make fun of things like stone fruit as like tasting notes, but that's like, that's apricots and peaches and things like that, things that have a pit. Mm -hmm. um, except for cherries and plums, which would be like red fruit or berries. Anyway, side notes. But the Texas barley can get kind of savory. It can almost have like cardamom and rosemary kind of notes. And it also has more like um, fresh field of like uh, hay, um, kind of dried hay stuff. So someone who loves all the, all the grain notes, there's just some stuff that the combination gives you that you just don't get. Is that, is that kind of like when I smell something I would just consider sort of bready? Um, yeah, sure. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And the fruit too. We've done. We've done. I think Alex, somebody picked up a bottle of High Plains earlier. High Plains is our completely unplanned. We do it when it suits us uh, exclusively. The Texas barley. Most of the Texas barley goes into lineage. Some of it we bottle by itself sometimes. Um, but when we do the High Plains, the you can almost imagine like walking out into a field where like something's getting cut um, or like a barn that the, the, the Scottish barley just doesn't give us that. And the fruit tends to be different. The spices tend to be different. Um, so yeah, it's a fun playing with like how the fruit reads and yeah, it's fun to have that many, uh, it's almost like a remix, right? Like it, you have like the original components, but then you have also like new things that came to the table. Right. Um, or a cover even for that matter, you know, which yeah. is, I feel like these days, especially online, somebody's dropping a cool cover like every day. Um, but when someone kind of reinterprets, so I mean, half the components that are in here are in one, but then you kind of got to get to see them in a different light and you get to juxtapose them against a different filter. Yeah. I, I, to be clear, this was bottled six days ago. Yeah. Maybe even sooner than that, possibly. Yeah. Because the the, wow. the, the the batches are getting, or the, you know, the, the, the batch or the blend, they're getting so big that they take multiple days to, to bottle just because the quantities are, are so large and there's only so many hours in the day. Um, I got a question so, for you, Alex. I got to ask a question for you. Okay. So <clears throat> this bottle is right up there with the elite of elite this is one of the highest end just most gorgeous beautiful whiskeys for a sophisticated palate uh for every palate but why this could be 90 dollars? but how, how much does this bottle cost and and why and is it a smart business decision <laughs> because it sounds uh. incredibly because it sounds incredibly affordable but there's a reason for that is it a smart business decision uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know why I'm saying that. You know why I'm yes, saying that. No, right? no, no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I. I just. Yeah. It. It's, it's way underpriced, and it, it but it's on no, purpose. It. It's. It's so intentional. I guess I've just never. I've never actually sat and thought about like, is it? Was this a? Again, and I had nothing to do with. <laughs> uh. Um. But I, sorry. To, it's just. I love. I this. I love you guys. Um. I enjoy these conversations so much. Um. This it's very price inclusive, and that that is so intentional. 
Yeah. Um, and that really is to be able to kind of come at the market with something that's so affordable, you can't deny it. Uh, and then, so I think it is, uh, it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the price point here is $39.99. That's um, crazy. That's, so I mean, that's incredible. actually, sometimes you can find this at, uh, man, I can't remember who it was. Um, if it was specs or total wine, someone was selling it, I believe for less than that, um, too, but in, in comparison, Mirador is $79.99. And then actually we'll talk about this in a second. Texas one single malt, uh, is now fifty nine ninety nine. Wow. It was previously sixty nine ninety nine. We'll talk about that in a second, but yeah. it is, it's so price inclusive, uh, again, which Jared can, can kind of go into, which is, uh, in somewhat of a similar vein to kind of the pot still bourbon price inclusivity, but, um, it really, it's fantastic for us to be able to kind of, again, bring people into the fold of not, not only our whiskeys that we're making, but then also the world of single malt in general. If, if we can invite people in, uh, and people can find this and love this because they love baby blue or because they love uh, maker's mark. Um, but they've never wanted to try American single malts because typically they are very expensive. Maybe they'll fall in love with this. And then, yes, please go buy Mirador. Please go buy Texas One Single Malt. But maybe then they'll be able to finally take a risk on someone that's what I, we believe, I think, equally fantastic producer like Westland um, producing American single malts as well. Because uh, American single malt doesn't, it's it's uh it's in that middle phase of it exists, but it doesn't exist, right, Jared? And and yeah. so yeah, being so inclusive with the price point and the proof to a certain degree, um, it, it invites so much conversation that I think is needed right now. Yeah, I mean, I've said this before, but I'm sure there are people that start distilleries thinking I'm going to make this really crazy luxury product that's like super high end and only rich people can afford. Um, that's not us at all. And the idea that someone's like, yeah, I've been hearing about this American single malt thing, but I don't know. I'm not ready to drop 75, 80, 90 bucks on a bottle on this kind of unproven thing when I can get bourbons I love for, you know, $23.99. Um, barley, barley is a, a lot more expensive. It's almost about three times more expensive per pound than corn. So there's a reason why those, those products are expensive to some degree, but yeah, we, we kind of made a decision to take a little bit of a hit bottle, you know, profit on a bottle to, to, to further the conversation and uh, to make sure that if anybody is really just holding out because of that, can we, can we kind of like remove that from the equation? You don't have to like single malt. I know plenty of bourbon dudes that, I mean, single malt's just not their jam. That's great. That's fine. Uh, I know single malt dudes that won't drink bourbon. Also great. Your palate's your palate. Um, but if there is someone that the price is kind of the barrier that's keeping them away or proof or, um, or even just like how burly and big and robust some of the stuff is like, cool, let's, let's just get that out of the way. And I don't know who we'll find. I don't know who that reaches, but I know it, it, they are out there. And, um, and, and like Alex was saying, you know, we're a part of the American single malt commission um, I'm the best vice president. We finally are like an official, like legit nonprofit now. And there are so many people in this country making fantastic, fantastic American single malts and the public needs to know about it, which is going to require some education. People need to be informed. They need to be exposed to the whole concept. Um, but the funny thing is we've got bourbon and rye and rum really as the original like kind of American spirits and all the people running those distilleries are like, a bunch of Scottish and Irish immigrants hmm. that would have been probably making single malt if they had single malt available, but they had rye or they had molasses or they had corn in the South and they made do. And now we have all these American traditions that really are rooted in, in, in um, single malt distillers that came to the new world and, and, and made roots and started laying down booze. So uh, yeah, it's a funny kind of, Ouroboros, the full circle, the snakes eating its tail thing, but the people made the music with the instruments they could get their hands on. Mm. Um, do you guys uh, do, lineage to me? Uh, and, and Ben kind of mentioned it. Lineage to me is it, it really is a miracle uh, that it tastes the way it tastes, and you guys offered at the price you offered at. It's almost like the uh, crack dealer in the nineteen ninety after school <laughs> special that gave away the first file. Um, but it's, dope man. It, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, he is dope, man. It, yeah. It's extraordinary, man. This is, 
I mean, I know there's other bottles that are probably have a different meaning to you guys for different reasons, but uh, I can see why it won the distinction that it won. It, it really is incredible. It's hard to believe that you guys are doing this. <laughs> I don't know if that's, it's hard to believe we're doing this. So thanks. I don't know if that's. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds yeah, 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 that yeah. I meant it. No, that you guys are able to do something like this. I'm good. I'm totally good. I'm kidding with you. Yeah, that, I'm the same way. Like, uh, like I said, we're Balcona's fanboys. And so we taste this and we know this is a hundred dollar bottle. It's a $100, <laughs> it's a $100 bottle of whiskey. And that's not what it's selling for. It's selling for $39.99. Right. So we think. We respect the hell out of that. We love the thought process. We love you guys as human beings. We love the people you are. This is incredibly thoughtful. And it's really cool of you guys to make this available at such an affordable price. That's what we're trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It. We're we're about to move to one, baby. But as we do that, can I throw a question out that a, a whiskey buddy of mine texted who's watching this? Yep. Are there any other, and he's probably thinking more about the Mirador. But are there any other limited edition different bottle styles coming up that you guys would like to tip your hand on? Mm, yeah, we're um, we're uh, very much intentionally making a pretty big single malt push this year. So this the next few months, Mirador hits. It's already been shipped. What do you got there, Alex? What are you doing? What are you doing off camera? Um, it's this that we've. I think we're going to talk about this uh, on the next. Uh, He's going to wave it talk. around so fast that we can't see what's on there. Um, we had a few things, obviously, for everybody last year was pretty weird. But, oh, Dusk and Dawn. Okay, yeah. We, we pushed a few releases that were slated for last year to this year. And it just so worked out that that means we have a really single malt heavy special release calendar for 2021. Um, Mirador just hit and it's about to show up at your stores um, I have a project that I can't talk about I can't name I can talk about it but I can't name it because I'm waiting on lawyers or something um, yeah turns out that's cool um, talking to lawyers about whiskey is great um, but we have a 100% Texas malt that we aged in some William Chris. Uh, which is a really rad hill country estate, Texas estate vineyard. Um, we picked up some dessert barrels that they did, some orange mus muscat barrel dessert wine that they did. And we put some Texas barley into that. That's coming up. That's going to be a distillery only. It's only three barrels, I think, in that blend. Oh, pretty cool. Pretty cool project. Oh. Dusk and Dawn, which is what uh, Alex was just holding up, is a collaboration we did with Hawk, H A A. K winery down near Houston that makes a Madeira style dessert wine. Madeira is a Portuguese style dessert wine, similar to Sherry um, in Spain. They have been doing it for a long time. They're grandfathered in. Not everybody can use that word, but they are allowed to do that because they've been doing it so long. Their dessert wines. We went down and me and Gabe drove in a U-Haul and picked up a bunch of barrels from them and finishing is weird, but the first round of putting whiskey into wine barrels you get a pretty intense extraction and the second round is a little more subtle so we're doing two bottlings of that dusk and dawn dawn is the first fill it's much more intense and rich and then dusk is the second fill um, those are going to go out to distribution in texas we've got pilgrimage we talked about zach earlier but i have developed a label his name is Zach Pilgrim. Zach Pilgrim was his last name. So we had about four or five at least projects we had always talked about and that we never did before he passed. And so we, we created a label to kind of harness those ideas as we continue to pursue them. The first of which is a Golden Promise, so our Scottish barley finished in a Sultern, which is a really delicious uh, white dessert wine. Yeah. Um, was your barrel still too? It was. Mine yeah. was finished so yours was peated. This is unpeated, yes. but still finished in the same kind of dessert wine barrels. The first of many pilgrimage releases we're going to do, but the first one is the, the Golden Promise Scottish Barley finished in Sultan barrels. Am I missing something, Alex? I feel we're so we're so single malt heavy this first first half of the year. 
I don't have a problem with it. We've got the two hot Dusk and Dawn, the two dessert wine Madeira barrel releases. We've got Pilgrimage, Golden There's Promise, and Sultaren. We've got the unnamed I, project yeah. in, the, in the Hill Country dessert wine barrels. There's the other else? Ampersand connective whiskeys. Um, yeah. Potentially yeah. the peated, but yeah, there's yeah. Like seven different malt releases this year, which again, it wasn't necessarily by design, but I think there's something beautiful about kind of the, again, the emergence of the American single malt movement and the timing of this with lineage coming, coming off the, uh, the whiskey advocate um, top 20, you know, number 17 on that list. So maybe it's just, it's perfect timing to really bring that into the fold. Some of this will be Texas only. Some of it will be distillery only. Some of it will be going outside of the state of Texas. So it's a really great time um, to just kind of keep pushing innovation with, with malt, which we're excited about. A uh, shout out here from uh, on YouTube from a gentleman named Jack White, who's watching Whiskey Talk. He says, I travel 230 plus days a year outside of Texas. Jeez. I carry lineage with me everywhere. I introduce as many people as I can to lineage. That's why I go through lineage at such a high rate. I preach Texas whiskey. So shout out Jack White. Dang. So Thanks, great Jack. with Tenacious D and School of Rock and so many great movies. I just, I thought White Stripes, but. Oh yeah, my bad. That's a different Jack, isn't it? Yep. Um. All right, School let's move on. Stripes. Texas one. Texas one. So Texas one, obviously, uh, kind of our flagship malt that's become kind of the uh, the grandpappy of our malt line. Lineage definitely takes the two traditions one step further uh, in the sense that we have barley from both uh, countries and continents, which wasn't available when we first got started. But Texas one is kind of our first attempt at what does it look like to take our, 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 the heritage of American whiskey and the heritage of the old world stuff that was kind of our inspiration. So it's hundred percent golden promise, which is the Scottish barley that we use a lot. And I won't say it's exclusively new Oak, but it's, it's majority. And it's the, the profile is about Oak. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had people at our tables at events, me and Alex being like, you know, whiskey live in New York or something like that. And people say they don't really drink single malts. They're a bourbon drinker and we can give them this and the wood character, which is depending on who you talk to. If you talk to Jimmy Russell or Jim Rutledge from four roses, these guys talk about somewhere between 60 and 80% of the final profile on bourbon is about the wood. Um, so we kind of did the same thing. We just did it with Scottish barley um, to try and, once again, even 12 years ago now, 12 and a half, Jesus, try and begin that conversation between drinkers that at the time, especially consider themselves in different camps. How can we do something that maybe blurs those lines a little bit? So there's a Scottish barley on our Scottish stills, then the Scottish yeast couldn't be more traditional until it hits barrel, hits barrel and it's virgin oak. Uh, the majority of it is virgin oak. Um, we use American, we use European, we use French. Um, which are all different oak species um, and also the, you know, the climate of those different growing regions affects them too. But um, the majority of it's American oak. There's next, next biggest portion is going to be European and a little bit of French that goes into the blends on uh, the Texas one. And Golden Promise has largely fallen by the wayside. And I know I've said this a million times over the last decade. Um, between the yeast we use, the stills we use, and this barley choice, um, we're kind of hearkening back to a, 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 an era of making Scottish single malt that is dead. Um, people have bypassed this barley variety for higher yielding ones, which higher yield just means you get more alcohol per pound, which mm -hmm. means more carbs um, and less flavor compounds. So um, we, we, we hope, I feel like we've accomplished bringing that barley variety back into some kind of public, more global conversations um, and um, happy to kind of, it's, it's, it's not quite museum, but I mean, on some level, it's what if, what if we were to make single malt the way they made it in the seventies and eighties and did it here. And then we treated it in a very American way. Um, 
And one of the really nice things about what's happening globally with single malt is that um, for someone who loves single malts, they're being made with grains that have never been used. They're being aged in areas of the world that never had single malt aging in them. They're being blended by people with a very different take. And so the, the, for, for just someone who's a single malt lover, it is like the golden age. I mean, there's just stuff coming to market that just blows your mind and it's not all going to work. We can, we can throw, you know, the noodles at the wall and that's not all going to stick, but man, some of the stuff that's coming to us is just like, man, we, we, we weren't going to drink single malt from Tasmania 10 years ago. We just weren't or Texas or Seattle, like, or New Mexico. These are, these are new, these are new, new dilemmas that we have to face on how we spend our dollars because there's just really cool stuff sitting on the shelf waiting for us, you know? It, so is it, uh, guys, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. I was going to say, you guys call it, uh, the flagship and it's nicknamed the one, uh, and so forth, you know, and, um, it's such an important part of the Balcona's story. And the thing that I always go back to that for me gets, gets me the most excited for you guys at that is that this one, a blind taste test in Scotland. And so like, what is, what does that even the awards and the the accolades and the praise. And I'm going to ask you, Alex, because I, I, I know Jared likes to, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't like to dwell in those things, but um, let's, let's talk about how celebrated and decorated this bad boy is, how recognized and respected it is. Yeah. I think when you look at metrics, which is usually, I think the easiest way for us to kind of grasp some of these things the, at this stage of, what are we three almost four months into 2021 this is the most decorated whiskey in one i mean probably singular whiskey bottlings this is one of the most decorated uh whiskeys in america uh it's by far the most decorated whiskey in texas as far as just kind of like national uh local and global accolades that it's won from new york to san francisco um, you know, it's some of the preeminent, yeah, blind tasting panels, um, somewhere close to a hundred gold, double golds, best in class. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's because of the, the familiarity, but polarizing movement of, um, old world and new world ideas and opportunities, uh, that was brought to the table by, you know, Jared and, and this being our flagship and having it, uh, be the first malt that we released, Technically, Jared, is it 2010 was the first bottling? 11, yeah. 11, um, where this was uh, available, certainly wasn't a main staple. Uh, I mean, even when, when I joined in 2016, this, you, you, we were still, we were just begging people to take it out of the, the lockbox or the glass case uh, behind the counter, or, you know, they got a dusty one up there being struck by sunlight but they wanted to show it off because they had it and we were just please we're making more of it you know take it it's not no no no. it's not i mean yes it's worth a hundred dollars but please don't price it at that uh it's it's more affordable now um which again is a point we should talk about in just a second because it's now even more affordable but um it's 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 definitely paved the way it's dark it's brooding um it's luxurious uh in, but still, I, I still think very approachable, right? Because again, it's not peated. It's not super earthy uh, by any means. A lot more of the dark fruit qualities kind of kind of bubble up. Um, a lot of dark, uh, I get a lot of dark red fruit characteristics. Some some people in like varnishy, kind of old world flavor profiles. And some folks even in tastings that we've done, um, they're like, God, this has got to be finished. Like this has got to be in sherry, uh, sherry cask. Like, no, I, I mean, unless I'm, I've been lied to, this is there's no sherry in this. Which, of course, sherry finishing in the world of malt is is very popular and it's absolutely delicious. But it's not. Um, it's just good grain and good wood. Um, so th- this is a it's a really fun whiskey. And and we kind of jumped up proof. We didn't we didn't talk about proof, but lineage um, was uh, is 94 and this is 106. So a bit of, a bit of a jump up. So it does feel bigger, richer. Uh, a little more tingly on the palate, but not, um, it, it doesn't strike you as, as hot. Um, it, it's just, I think, a fuller pour. Um, there's a lot more going on here um, than, than maybe some people realize, but 
I don't when know, I when good. I when I smell it, for whatever reason, I smell caramel, but I don't ever taste that. Mm. Mm. You know, and you're talking about uh, there isn't like the singe, but it definitely does go immediately to the back of my tongue. That's where I feel it first. It, but it, it's not like, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, the smoke on a pita or something. It's not that experience at all. But I smell caramel. I don't taste caramel. And, but then the first place I feel it on my tongue is the back of my tongue. Yeah, I, I, I get a little more kind of um, like, uh, oh man, what is it called when, like if you were to put uh, like Luxardo cherries in a hot pan, I don't know how many people actually do that, but that's just what I think of where you start re like a reduction, just like, a, or even like a red wine reduction, not quite balsamic or anything like a sour vinaigrette, but just stewed and uh, concentrated qualities you get some bready characteristics kind of fluttering in and out but i think the the barrel character is much more present where we went from kind of really light and fluttery lemon and fresh apricot to a little more of a, a bready croissant type character and lineage again these are just my notes these are, jared's like this guy doesn't know what he's talking mm -hmm. and then you know you start going to like a varnishy red fruit quality is what i and i that's why i love yeah. the some connected tissue but no, I love I love the combination of the right the right headiness, like the solvents, uh, the lighter the lighter compounds, and you you kind of get maybe it's tobacco, maybe it's oak, maybe it's leather. Um, the way those play together and and kind of imply some some fruit. You know, it's not it's maybe not quite like mulberry, maybe it's more like blackberry, but like there's some tartness there, but it's dark, um, and it's thoughtful. I think this is a this is a whiskey that I think for people that like pipe and cigar guys or mm -hmm. um, I haven't had it a lot on the rocks, so I can't speak to that too much. But even there, I can imagine there's enough going on that it would hold up pretty well and still would end up being a pretty robust, you know, pour. So if you think about the uh, the pricing, the way all this works now, so. In the single malt family, you got lineage at 39, which is crazy. You got the flagship, which I thought might be the most expensive one, now incredibly affordably priced at 59. And then you've got this bad boy, Mirador, priced at 79. Yep. Is that so? It's all incredibly accessible. So is this an overall kind of thought process for Balcones to? make all three of these accessible because they all seem to be incredibly well-priced. I mean, money is weird and dumb, but <laughs> there, there is a level of scarcity and, and I'm sure you guys can appreciate the same thing in some sphere, but um, the, the, how hard it is to find the barrels that we use for Mirador. I hate doing this. I hate doing it even when we have, we, we used to, you know, pre-COVID we were doing master classes at the distillery and we had a couple of bad experiences where a bunch of us are here all day on a Saturday and we're going to do like this four hour blending class with people who just bought tickets and came in. And there was one time where it was basically like a bachelor party, like, we had two people that were there that were like super engaged and the other eight were there just to like party. Right. And it ruined the experience for us. It ruined the experience for those two people that thought we're about to dig in. We're about to really spend an extended amount of time really digging in on this aspect of whiskey making that a consumer doesn't necessarily get to have all the time. So I hate doing it, but there is something to how you price things to make sure it ends up in the right hands, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And Mirador is an oddball for us. The role it serves in our portfolio of our, our whiskey portfolio. I want to make sure as little of it as I have, I want to make sure it gets with the right folks. And um, lineage is the opposite. Lineage is like, man, anybody who's never even heard of American single malt, I want this in their hand and I want them to be asking themselves like, well, what else is there? 
what else is out there like this? And I want them to be looking at Delbach and I want them to be looking at Few and I want them to be looking at Virginia Highland and going, oh, I've seen that around. I just never picked it up. And if that's the bottle because the price point fits and it, it kind of like, you know, brings them in, that's great. Um, but yeah, we've, value is a tough, value is a tough proposition, you know? I mean, we, we try to put things where we feel okay about what we're asking people to pay for them. Um, and we, Alex mentioned earlier, we, we just dropped the price on the single malt, partly because you're looking at port, your portfolio and like, oh, here's our regular. And then, well, special releases have to be more expensive than that. And if those hit the market higher than you want, it's like, well, what do we do? Okay, we got to lower this one so that those don't have to go so much higher to make up for it. I just want to get the whiskey in the hands of the people, man. I mean, I don't, it's, 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 I don't know who our folks are. I don't know who our people are, but I do know we make some stuff that we are really happy about that we've gotten feedback from our industry over the, over a decade. Other people agree. This is some great stuff. Okay, great. It's not for everybody. Nobody makes anything that's for everybody. If you make something for everybody, it's going to be washed out, boring. People will, no one will be offended and no one will love it, you know? So we got to find our people. We got to get these bottles in the hands, even with our investors and stuff. Like how big do you get or not get? What volume do you need to produce? I don't know. We need to find our folks. We need to find people that what we do checks their boxes or what they're looking for. And if we have scoured the planet and we have found them all and we can supply them with what they want, that's when we'll know like how much to make. Like it's not really that complicated. It's a mess to get done, but philosophically, like I am not trying, I don't have any interest in convincing someone that they, they need to be a Balcones consumer. If that's not your jam, that's great. Like go do your thing. Let's not convert people. Let's just find people. It checks my boxes. I'm sure there's someone out there and we hear these stories all the time. Someone's just like, man, I finally got around to it. Holy crap. Why did not not try this earlier? This is exactly what I'm looking for in whiskey. Great. Let's find all those people and however many of them they are and however many bottles they go through a month. And that's how much we'll make. And the great thing today with the, I mean, COVID helped, but the, with the kind of ascension of whiskey clubs and groups, there is so much more interaction between the producers and the consumers. And it's so much less hierarchical and just like, we make this shit and we are going to hire a marketing team to shove it down your throat. And now it's like, what are you looking for? And what do people want? And like, could we make this? Like, sure, why not? Let's try it. And now there's just this dialogue that's much more flattened and much more like we're all in equal standing. You happen to work in some whatever industry. You're a huge whiskey nerd. Great. You have direct access to producers. Let's get our heads together and let's talk about the future and let's plan it together. And market-wise, obviously that makes sense. And existentially to me, it kind of reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. Like you pull back the curtain, and it's just like a weird dude back there. Like that's not, that's that's lame. It's 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 a smoke screen. Let's just get people together who care about this and let's plan the future and build it together. And that's kind of what's happening. And so it's really. I, I couldn't be more excited about the current state and the roadmap, the trajectory, the curve looks like it's heading in a really, really cool place. That's to me as a producer who it's very easy to get separated from the, from the end people that are buying this stuff and drinking it. I love that, that, that gap is kind of like we are shortening that, 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 that distance. Um, and I get to have a lot more direct interaction and hear from the people that really, really care and uh, make sure that we're we're communicating something relevant you know give the people what they want yeah got to give the people little ojs give the people what they what want, want. Okay. um all right gentlemen is there any uh i don't know parting shot so to speak we're going to be doing this uh we're back to our schedule of doing this once a month for a while by the way we had our hiatus. Oh, we didn't say this. I'm sorry. We should because I need. I don't know the answer. Uh, the batch on uh, on the one is SM, obviously for single malt, and it's twenty dash one, and then there's three in parenthesis. What is the three in parenthesis? So yeah, the 
we do a blend and the blend is 20-1 and then the parentheses is the modeling date because like I, we were talking about earlier it takes multiple days mm -hmm. there shouldn't be much difference but part of it's internal we want to know if i see a parentheses one two three or four i want to know which day gotcha. that actually came off the bottling line even though it's the same batch of barrels okay so this um, is a day three that i was sipping on yep uh, yeah so the, the the beauty of being able to kind of track if you will, um, is that, for instance, like with Mirador, um, for anybody that ever stumbles upon it, that's either watching this or knows Balcon as well, um, kind of back to the Zach Pilgrim story, if you were to ever meander into a store in Weatherford or something and you find Mirador and you're like, oh, cool, Mirador. Yeah, I remember watching Ben and Skin. You're like, whoa, this is an 18-1, you know, and it's like, whoa, that's, that's the you know, that was the, the batch that, you know, Zach Pilgrim specifically helped with, and that's the inaugural batch, right? right so, right. you know, when it comes to then lineage, um, Jared, the the bottling of lineage that um, uh, I guess technically uh, won uh, whiskey, or the, the, at least the one that Whiskey Advocate uh, showcased, that was 20-2, uh, 20, -2? Yeah. 20 uh, SML 20-2. So there's a really unique aspect of being able to kind of get close to the producer in that sense of finding things and picking up nuances and then being able to find them out in the wild uh, and, and being able to, like with some other distilleries, people will be like, oh, that's the one, that's the 150 proof. Not that, that you can't, that's really high, but you know, they, they would look at a 57.6 ABV. Oh, that was the 2016 batch. That is way fruitier. I actually like the 61, you know, ABV proof. We just happen to have batch codes um, that can kind of help uh, guide. It. We like Jared said internally, but then also externally, we've definitely met folks who are like, no, 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 no. 2018, that year of rumble was the best ever. You're right. Like, that's awesome. That's cool. And so you can kind of start like building this story um, that's appropriately because just like Jared and Gabe and Johnson, everybody, there's a, there's a, there's a flavor spectrum that can, can ride in and out of these, these blends, which is so fun to be able to, to read and, and see uh, as you taste through the different whiskeys. So what I can't wait for is for the distillery to be open. We want to come hang out with you guys. We want to do a tour and our, our new show is doing really well. And we're happy to be on iHeartRadio 97.1 The Eagle. And they have, some pretty incredible technology. And I noticed this skin that uh, Dan uh, was doing the show from like Jamaica or something, right? Like he was <laughs> on a doing it from vacation, which makes me think we might be able to do a remote broadcast from Balcones and Waco. And if we yeah, planned it enough, if we planned it enough in advance, we'll book hotels and we'll invite listeners. Hey, if you want to come down party in Waco, we'll do like do a Friday show get a hotel, maybe do some VIP tour of the facilities. And, um, you know, as soon as we're able to do something like that, we would absolutely love that just to come hang out with you guys. That'd be great. I, I think the last time we were all together was at Texas Live. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My gosh. It's been a long time, y'all. It's been a really yeah. long time. Yeah. Long enough for you grow mullets and stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of the mullet. It's great. It's luxurious. Look at the I'm, waves. I'm so, happy, I'm so happy that the mullet's kind of having a little bit of a comeback, you know, like pleated jeans and mullets and stuff. Like, let's, let's do it again. Oh, I'm wearing pleated jeans right now. I'm down. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got uh, a, a subgenre. I'm a big metal fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hyphenated slashes, like, yeah. you, know, you can have like 12 different descriptors for your band. Yeah. And, and mullets people maybe people don't know this but mullets can go in the same direction there's a, there's a lot of subcategories of mullet um huh. my hair's grown out because of covid well not because of covid i just <laughs> I, I cut my hair on here anyway but it's been growing for a while but i have what we, what we call the drullet oh yeah oh. look at that this is a dread mullet the rest yeah. of my hair the rest oh. of my hair is getting long but at some point all of that was short except this like dread mullet thing I yeah put on the back known as a drillet. So for your fans, oh, uh, for your listeners that, that uh, maybe got a little nappy, nappy goodness going on in the back from the pillow, mm -hmm, uh, yeah. drill it. That's what you're working on. And go oh, like Alex, what is your haircut called? 
Uh, Alex is uh, Alex is know. working on Alex is awesome and it's perfect because he's a ginger and yeah. oh, this, okay. this this plays into his his goal and his apparently his, there was a conversation that had to happen and his wife approved the, the project he wants to grow his hair out so he can do like willy braids oh, oh yeah and, yeah dude and he may be I don't know if he's even old enough or cultured enough to be familiar with Redheaded stranger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm. I, I can't wait for my 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 right hand, my partner in crime, when we hit the road and go to sell whiskey all over the country. I, I'm I'm ready for these for these red red hair. Hell yeah! It's not. I feel like I mean I could probably do it, but it wouldn't. It's not quite there yet. Uh, wait, wait till it's really like impressive. Yeah. yeah. The time of the preacher. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'd Just like to take a curling iron to that. Uh, <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been real. Uh, I think in honor of Jared Levin Metal, we're all going to put a numblot over a vowel in our name and uh, move on accordingly. We can use a V for a U. That's a big thing, too. Oh, is it really? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You put a V instead of a U. Also, because we usually tend to have some sort of music related thing, um, I don't have a whole lot to bring to the table with new releases, except in my normal brooding moderately uh death obsessed way uh nick cave and warren ellis warren ellis is who's like nick cave's main collaborator over the last like three albums four albums uh they released their kind of quarantine uh written i think they did it they wrote and and, and recorded these tunes over like four or five days but it just came out a couple of weeks ago it's called carnage and it's if you're ready to process some of your quarantine feelings, it's a it's a solid solid set, okay. of, set of tunes. We're, Nick we're Cage using... also an incredible actor. <laughs> yes. Paint, yes, face off. Yep. <laughs> that that must have been done in between albums. <laughs> Holy crap! I don't know. I love Grease. <laughs> yeah, Grease. Anyway, uh, cool. Anybody else have shit. anybody got some music drops? No. Do y'all do y'all know what Skin's doing? Skin's, Dude, I was skin's... just. You, yeah. You, oh, you mean you mean this? Yes. Yes. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. Yeah. Truth I, to I, power, dude. To this drop is great. It. Yeah, dude. I'm so proud of him. He's he's killing it, dude. He's got a song out with Leon Bridges. Who's that? Like is a uh, it's a cover huge, song. Man. It's a cover tune of. Um, the old uh, it's Pastor, uh, I'm sorry, Bishop T. L. Barrett is a. Uh, he put out some gospel records in the '70s with the Chicago Youth Choir, and uh, that particular song, "Like a Ship," was redone by Leon Bridges and Keith Young. Keith Young's in a band called Medicine Man Revival, and uh, it's a it's a good batch of musicians. Jordash Grant, who plays keys with uh, Abraham Alexander and Paul Coffin. Sput Seawright on drums, who is in Ghost Note and Snarky Puppy and has played with Kendrick Lamar and Justin Timberlake. And then Danny Bayless of Bastards of Soul, as well as uh, the Hardline Radio Show. They're the band. And then uh, several really good singers in the choir. And that is on your streaming platforms, Like a Ship, under Leon Bridges. And then we'll have a full triple compilation record coming out in June more details to come so that's cool, cool. What a cool more writing stuff that's awesome hell yeah hell yeah well we love you boys we miss you we're proud yeah. to be affiliated with you we love your whiskey keep churning out kick-ass whiskey and uh we'll be down there to see you at the distillery soon yeah let's get together before too long hopefully soon love it all yeah. right later boys until later. next time enjoy some balcones we'll bring you some new expressions next time around good evening everybody